How do you listen to how, how do you listen to a good message? How do you how do you take a message, even if it's not a good message, and get something out of it? And let me just say a few points here. Number one, when it comes to God's word in your life, listen with your heart. You say, what does that mean? Well, that's a lot to figure out. But list, learn what it means. Learn how to listen with your heart, where you feel things, where you, where you really abide. The, uh, our tendency is to listen with our, our heads. And we come in sometimes you know, with anything, not just here at church, but in all conversations. We listen with our heads, and we're ready to analyze it. We're ready to come up with our own uh, response to it, whatever else. But I tell you what, your life will grow so much faster if you learn to listen with your heart and trust it. And it takes a lot of trust because it's like, oh, I don't want to be a fool. I don't want, I want to, you know, make sure I'm listening. And I was just talking to my sister Kay, and I don't know, you know, things change, information changes. But we are learning more and more that uh, your cognitive mind, most, most people say that we don't, most kids don't reach where they're really thinking in a cognitive term in their brains till they're 12. That means... But especially we know that the first few years, they're really listening with their heart, not their head. And Kay and I were just discussing, and you know, I don't want to get into it now and make you all mad, but it's a real common thing right now for parents to think that they ought to really reason with their kids all the time. I mean, that's a real cultural thing right now. You see parents all the time in a store sitting on, the, you know, going through and having a, and then trying to reason with them, and they don't have the capacity to reason. So it is good practice for you, okay? Just know that when you're talking to your kid on the reasoning level, you're really just looking at a mirror talking to yourself because it's just going like this for them. They don't reason. They, can't have, they don't have that capacity. But they do feel, and I mean, their heart perceptors can pick up so many more trillion bits of information than their mind ever will. And that's why kids are so, learn so stinking fast, is because they learn with their heart. And it takes them the rest of their life to try to get it to their mind and, and get renewed. And that's the thing you do. Listen to a message. Don't listen to it critical because you're, you're going to shut things down. You're going to shut the gate down. Listen to it with your heart. Let it, let it touch you. Let it make you feel things. Don't be skeptical. Don't be cynical. Uh, and then afterwards, go and find all the scriptures. Don't be looking for all the scriptures while you're listening to the message. Don't be, you know, when Tammy was quoting the scriptures the, uh, the other day, and even when Rod and Jen did it, I did a lot better shutting my eyes and just listening because then I wasn't looking at her, seeing if, she's, if her pause was trying to remember what's, you know, or if she was just pausing for an effect. And if I didn't look at her, then it had just to touch my heart that she was pausing for effect. And it was the same with Rod and Jen. You know, they, when they paused, a lot of times uh, I just had to talk. I had to get my mind out of the way and just start listening with my heart and feeling it. And boy, Ruth came alive to me. Oh, my gosh. And even, even the Sermon on the Mount, what Tammy did, really speaks to me. The more, you know, learn to listen with your heart. Learn to go home then and then do your analysis and check things out. Get in the Word and that's why sometimes I don't read a lot of scriptures and everything here because those of you that are so set on your mind, you, you think you're actually getting it where it's, you've just canceled it out because you didn't listen with your heart. So listen with your heart. Let it touch you. Let it feel it. And then go home. And, and, uh, and, and here's the thing. It, it, th what you do after you leave the service is way more critical than just being here. No message is going to put you over unless you let it sink in and meditate on it, spend some time with it, incubate it till it hatches inside you. So it's, it's uh, you know, one of the reasons that uh, I finally decided to, to not have Sunday night services, Wednesday night services, because you can't digest that much. You really can't take that much in. And, and uh, it's what we were trying to do sometimes is just go to church so often that all our meditation was in church. Cause we're, and, maybe, and, and it's not saying it doesn't work very good, but... And we're pretty strong in this church about you and your relationship with God. Not you becoming part of a big thing that we can brag about to everybody. Uh, man, when we sing those songs, like the song we just sang, it really ministers to me. I, I cry almost every time. I can hardly get through the song and post with my sciences. I'm cracking up anyway. I'm certain. But anyway, just what it says, you know, when I go back into dust, that was the last song we sang. What's the one in 10,000? Yeah, but what's that part where it says, uh, when I, and on, that day, on, 
And on that day when my strength is failing, man, I hit that part and I just start tearing up because from the time I was a kid, I focused in on that day. I find it really unusual. I'm not sure a lot of people do this, but I focused in on my, I think about my last days on earth a lot. And you say, well, boy, isn't that depressing? No. It's like looking at the finish line. It's keeping your focus on the finish line so that you stay in the race. And it keeps me, reminded me, all, reminds me all the time of why I'm really living. Because otherwise, I get, if I get my mind just only on today, I get real disappointed. Because it's never quite enough, and it's never quite what I thought it was going to be, and then it's already over. <laughs> how, many of you, how many of you know that the most disgusting thing about a birthday is that when it finally comes, it's over? And then you've got to wait another year. And then Christmas, you've got to wait all that year, and then it comes, and it's over. And it's like... And how I many of you know it's just a weekend off for the 4th of July, it's over. It's almost like so disgusting because it happens so fast and then you've got to wait another year. So I'd rather keep my mind, I, I mean, I go there and I just think, man, when I get old, and I, I do, I don't know who's going to be around me. I've, I've pictured you guys. I've pictured myself going in church. I don't know. I think it'd be kind of fun to say goodbye to you in my last seconds, to have all of you here. I've been with people like Esther Wallman and Myrna when they were on their deathbed and other, many other people when they're in a hospital room, so I've, I've visualized that. I've seen my kids around. Now I have to add the grandkids, you know, and uh, say my goodbyes. But what it does is it helps me realize that I'm living the dream right now. And if you, didn't get, if you weren't here last Sunday, I really encourage you to get a hold of the message last Sunday. Now, I, I know some... some Vicky even asked me, he says, is the church really hurting financially? No, I'm just, I can have I vent a little bit that May's offerings were way down. I'm just saying, for all of us, there's disappointments, aren't there? For all of us, there's times it seems like things just aren't quite working right. And uh, God just said, he said, you know, you're living your dream as a child. You wanted to live on the edge. You wanted to live with a living God. You wanted to, you, you wanted to experience the miracles. And I won't go into it, but it's a good message just saying, you know, you can't experience the miracle of having the the sea part in front of you unless you've got an Egyptian army on your tail and you're about to get wiped out. That's when life gets exciting. So I want to I want to just go today and I want to ask you a question first of all. Um, how many of you find yourself desiring a break? Have you just said that in any way a break? <clears throat> okay. Um, those of you who just find yourself desiring a break, would you stand, please? I'm, I'm not going to make do weird things or anything, but uh, because I, I, I've been I, a lot of times, I've been saying I just need a break, okay? Yeah, and it might be a break from. Well, let's don't go into that. There's just so many things you could use a break from, okay? Um, Father God, I just thank you that you're a God that gives us breaks. And uh, we ask in the precious name of Jesus that this desire that's inside our hearts is from you and that you guide us and help us find those breaks that we need. And we trust in you and we're going to rely upon you and we're going uh, to get the break that we need and the restoration that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, it's so important sometimes just to do the word, just to say the word and just to say, I need a break. And pray it. And ask God for it instead of just feel it and mutter it. Let me say some things about, uh, some wisdom about how, taking a break. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter, the first few verses about marriage and comparing our relationship with God. And one thing he said, he said, you know, um, you're, you're given to each other. Um, take care of each other. And don't neglect one another except... If you come to an agreement, basically, to take a break from each other for the purpose of prayer and seeking the Lord. Now, this is a principle that I believe God is, uh, is, will help us in everything. There's times you just need a break from kids. Your kids aren't in here. You can go like that. <laughs> we're, we're not recording your head nods. There's times you need a break from your grandkids. There's a time you need a break from work. There's a time you need a break from certain friends. Okay? 
If you take a break with the intent, I just need a break. I just need to, uh, you know, uh, get some, I'm exhausted. I need an escape. You're going to go into that break with a hard attitude just to escape. And by the time you get done with your break, you're going to come back and be in the same place you were before or worse. You're going to take a break from work, and you're going to go back to work. And by the time you go back to work, you're going to hate work more than when you left work. And so it is a very, very important, our heart intent, that we don't try to take a break just because we are destitute, desperate, wiped out. Man, how many of you know that you, you've taken a, taken a day off, and when the day was over, you were still as wiped out as you were the day before? And, and in fact, you had less attitude to want to come back into it, right? So when you take a break, you, know, you say, well, does everything have to be done by faith and hard intent? Yes, it does. <laughs> it just does. It just does. You live out of, the Bible said, Jesus said, you live out of your heart. So your heart intent is so important. So if you feel like you need to take a break, then say, God, I need to take a break. But take it with the intent to be restored. Draw near to your God in that time. And when it says, you know, take a break from one another in 1 Corinthians 7, you know, for the purpose of prayer, to devote yourself to prayer. You know, that's not laboring in prayer. That's not going to God and going into another work session. That's going into God with, like Jesus did to say, come away to a lonely place, guys. We've had a lot of crowds. We've had ministering to a lot of people. And, he, and Jesus, said, Jesus said, we need a break. And so he took a break, but what he did, he got alone, and he just fellowship with God, and he was restored, and when he got up in the morning, he was ready to go. That's, that will happen if you have the right heart intent, and, and that's what you're believing for, and that's what you go for. But I'm telling you, you get the attitude that you just need a break, and it's, it's going to, you're going to get it, but it's gonna, you're going to end up just digging yourself deeper and deeper in the hole. But don't, don't be afraid about getting a break. I mean, you know, come away. Separate yourself from work. Separate yourself from friends. Separate yourself from pressure. Um, separate yourself from church. There's times you need a break from church. Uh, but if you take a break from church and you're saying, I'm just tired, I'm just weary, I'm just fed up, I, you know, da 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 da, you're going to find yourself like that grapevine Lisa brought up here, that dried up, withered thing. If you separate and say, you know, I just need to be by myself for a while, alone from my wife, alone from my family, alone from the church, and alone from everybody. But boy, if you don't do it with a hard intent to get alone with God and just and let him love on you and hug you, it's not to go get with God and fast and pray and, and you know, and beat, on, beat on heaven's gates and all that. Man, no, go run to your heavenly father and collapse in his arms. And if you do that, there's times I believe people need to take a break from church and separate. Then they'll come back with enthusiasm and love for everything. But if you separate because you just, I'm just tired, I'm weary, a da 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 I tell you, you're going to get more weary. But don't feel bad at all for taking breaks and coming and getting alone. Uh, but stay, as Lisa ministered this morning, stay, stay with your father, man. He's not the one you need a break from. You know, I thought it was so cool what Rod said. You know, he just said, you know, God gave us, uh, you know, so much word. And then man added a stack of uh, religion on top of it, you know, piles and piles. And that's so true. We, a lot of times what you and I really need a break from is from all the religion, all the rules and a extra things that man has added to this pure word. This, if this word doesn't encourage you, doesn't lift you up, doesn't set you free, doesn't build you up, it's not, you're hearing it the, the wrong way. Because he's, I just, I don't know, you can be convinced what you are. I'm convinced God never tears me down. He's never trying to shame me. He's never trying to condemn me. He's, you know, even his corrections are as gentle as all get out. Uh, that's awesome. And then you can come back to your truth. You know, there's times that I've had to take a break from friends, and, you know, because how many of you know there's certain friends that, you know, I used to say in high school, but it still happens today. There's certain friends that you get together with, and it's just like, you know, it's like uh, sodium and chloride taking, a, you know. Uh, well, no, that's, a, uh, that's not a good one. Uh, <laughs> those things, you put them together, and it's good. You got salt. But there's some people, you know, separate, they're okay, put them together, and it just, it's bad news. 
two good boys coming together can be just horrible at times. You know, it, yeah, and I mean, I knew that in school. I knew there were certain kids that I got with, you know, we were both good kids. But when we got together, somehow we fed each other's dark side. <laughs> Man, we came up, you know, and there's times you just had to take a, you got to get away from them. You know, and again, do it with the intent <clears throat> of drawing near to God and for the purpose of growth. And sometimes then I came back and, then, and those friendships flourished. And there's other times I, when I came back, I said, you know something? This one's not working for me or for them. This one needs to be cut off. This one needs to be pruned. Well, I just, I really like it. Listen, I, it's not just young people. There are friendships that if they're taking you down and not taking you in the right direction, stop being so loyal. You're not helping them and you're not helping yourself at all. In fact, you will help them along with yourself if you will separate from them and, 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 and keep yourself where you need to be. Enough said there. Now, <clears throat> we've discussed how, how we might desire a break. Now let's talk about how many of you desire a breakthrough? A breakthrough. If you desire a breakthrough, would you stand? <laughs> Leave her alone, Mom. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Father, we're standing on purpose, with purpose, with intent. We're standing today not just in the midst of this congregation of wonderful people. But we're standing before your throne of grace. And we feel a need for a breakthrough. God, you are the Lord or the master of the breakthrough. And master, we are standing before you seeking Believing for breakthrough. Now, Holy Spirit, instruct us how to walk into that breakthrough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you expect the Lord to teach you something, not just today, but every day. Let me talk a little bit about this breakthrough. There are laws of the creation that were put here by the Creator. And... Um, they were twisted by the fall of man. This is important for you to understand. I believe it's real important. When the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, that looks like God just made a decision to say, I think I'll just harden Pharaoh's heart and make this a game. I don't believe that. that does not, that's not consistent with the rest of the word. It was an atheist who said in his latter years, he said, I've come to believe now that there is a God. But I believe he is just the accumulation of all the rules that runs the universe. What's his name? You may know. Starts with an S. The big, the, the big biologist that... Uh, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan said on his deathbed, he says, I used to believe there was no God. I believe there is a God now, but he's a combination of all the rules of the universe. And when I first heard that, I thought, you came closer, but <laughs> type thing. And I go, man, I, I tell you, I, I'm, I, hope, I hope he's in heaven. I, I'd like to talk to him. I, the more I got thinking about it, the, I felt the Holy Spirit said, you know, he said something pretty profound there. And so I've been thinking about it. Thinking about it. I thought, man, I really like this. I see God as a personal human being, don't you? I mean, he, he's our Father, He's the Son, He's the Holy Spirit. But the whole thing we believe is being, you know, uh, by the way, if you want to have some fun in your lives, stop calling yourself a Christian. That's really not a God term. I, would, I don't call myself a Christian. It's not that it's wrong. It's I am a Christian. Do you know what I like to say? I'm a man of God. I'm a, 
I was going to say woman of God, but you obviously understand I'm talking about for you women, you could say that. <laughs> Although I can, I am a woman of God in ways. But I'm a man of God. You know what that does? It puts, I don't know, for you, I hope it helps you. It helps me just to say, you know, I'm not just joined a group. I didn't join an organization. I don't, I don't just belong to this section or this section. I personally am a man of God. I walk on the earth as a man of God. I walk on the earth with miracles happening every day because God lives inside of me. His power is inside of me. I'm at the right place at the right time. That's who I am. That's what I do. Okay? And part of that is, part of the laws that, but you see, God is, is a personal being, but he also is what he made. When he made this creation, he made it out of himself. He holds it all together. He, you know, we're learning that he's, he's in everything. He really is, you know. Um, he's in the trees. He's in the flowers. Why? Because he's the creator. He made everything. He's in each one of us. Even if we don't believe in him, he's in us, all right? You don't breathe without him. But he also is accumulation of all the rules that he's laid out, all the laws of nature that he's put out there. The Bible says if you want to know the nature of God, look at nature and you're going to see him because it came out of him and is him and, and he holds it all together. So, so when you look at that, then you can say all the laws that God put in place when he created the universe and made man and made the earth and all that, all those laws that he laid out through those, through those laws being in power and working, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why? Because Pharaoh kept saying no to God. And the rules are, and the law is, you keep saying no to God, you're going to get calloused. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart, not out of a choice of God saying, I, to prove a point, I'm going to, no, but God just said, here's the rules I laid out. And Pharaoh, uh, you keep saying no, you're going to get your heart callous. Now, isn't that true for all of us in our relationships with each? Your kid keeps saying no to you pretty soon. They get to where they're saying no to you when you've got a, a bazooka in your hand pointed at them. It's like, you know, they can get so hard-hearted. breakthroughs so in second samuel we read that the philistines came against david after he moved to uh, the capital to, to jerusalem it's interesting that when david killed goliath jerusalem wasn't a, f a big phenomenal city but when he killed goliath what's the next thing he did after he killed him he cut his head off. Now, I just saw a picture. Um, Lonnie just brought me a picture. Dan came home the other night. His dog looked a little bad, whatever. Anyway, they found this big rattlesnake in their, uh, right in their house in the well, I think, uh, the, around the basement or whatever else. I can't. Anyway, she went out there and was looking down like this because she thought a garden hose was rattling or something. <laughs> anyway, she's got this video, and they put it up, and they chopped its head off, and, and they got a video it's still moving. And... Um, Anyway, I got this picture in my mind now. I'm totally lost where I was. But David cut off Goliath's head. But then it says that he grabbed that head, put it in a bag, and carried it. <laughs> now, a giant's head... Ours weighs eight to nine pounds. And Elisa once had to carry a girl's head down from they were at a church camp, and she... She hit her head on a tree on a toboggan run, and, and so then she was knocked out. And so I never forgot this. She says, you know, they had her body near, you know, she was okay. Well, I think she lived. I think she might have been paralyzed. But anyway, Lisa was carrying the head, and everybody else was carrying the body. And by, she said, by the time we got her to the building, she said, I was exhausted. It's amazing how a head that's not got any muscle tone to it is heavy. Well, this head had to be pretty good size because it was Goliath, and he's a loud mouth anyway. So anyway, the, and, and you read about it, and David grabbed that head and pulled it out of the bag and held it up to Jerusalem. It was an interesting thing. 
I'm not sure what all the significance was, but it was like God placed it in David, I believe, that Jerusalem was going to be a holy city. And he, like, he held the head up and just said, I took this man out, I'm coming for you. And David made Jerusalem a holy city, and when he did, the Philistines came at him at, in gr- droves. And they, they came by the thousands, the tens of thousands, and they camped all around. And David said to God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Do I go against them or don't? And he says, go against them. And he went to the certain city, Baal something, Zimmon, and it means master of the breakthrough. And what a beautiful, beautiful t- t- term, huh? No, it wasn't zigzag. It's B-A-L-L something I never, it's Hebrew, who cares? But I mean, master of the breakthrough. God is the master of breakthrough. And he broke through those ranks and he took them out. Think about breakthroughs. How many other breakthroughs do we know? Especially in scriptures. What other breakthroughs happen? Man, Israel getting out of Egypt... Now, I'm going to throw this out. Build up brings breakthrough. Say it with me. Say, build up brings breakthrough. You build something up, it can eventually break through. 400 years they're in Egypt. 400 years they're being crying out to God. 400 years. And then that's a lot of build up. Build up of prayers. Build up of crying out to the Lord. It brought a breakthrough. By the way, sometimes or in natural law, the bigger and the longer the buildup, the bigger and the grander the breakthrough. Hoover Dam, they tell me, dammed up the Colorado. What a, what a feat. I mean, I got to admit, what a... I mean, my brother and I, we did some crazy things on the farm, you know. Uh, I'm not sure we... Some of our breakthroughs were not really on the positive side. Um, I had more fun breaking beavers' dams up with dynamite than I did building. I mean, we did do some dams, but and we did build a dam. Actually, my dad did. But, uh, but anyway, that's quite a feat to build up the Hoover. And it, it backed up, nine, they say, 9.2 trillion gallons of water. If you get to go down there and see it, it's just phenomenal to see. Just what it did to back up all that water produces a tremendous amount, like three times the amount of a nuclear uh, electro plant. But that's a lot of buildup in it. And what if it breaks? What if there's a breakthrough in that dam? That's a big one. Somebody downstream is going to find out. Our little rapid city that had the, the flood in 1972, the dam broke, and it was amazing, the devastation that took place afterwards. Um, I got on YouTube and just started look at, you know, looking at breakthroughs. I just typed in breakthroughs. I got to see them blow a dam up in China. That was pretty awesome. Um, I got to see one guy who went out and ch- uh, pumped water in a, in a uh, pumped air into a a lake or whatever else. He chopped a hole and it had frozen over. And then he took an air hose in and uh, you could see the air just bubbling. And he's just sitting there going, it's building up. It's building up. <laughs> and I'm going, and it's going to break through. And it finally did. Kaboosh, you know. Build up brings breakthrough. If you want a breakthrough in your life, there has to be a build up. To build up, you have to have time. You gotta be persistent. So I look at this, I look at some breakthroughs like in Acts nineteen twenty it says that uh, the well let's go there let's look that one up Acts nineteen twenty. Acts nineteen twenty. So the word of God was growing mightily and prevailing. 
You go up just a few verses and it says, all of Asia heard the word of God. Asia became a major, major Christian center. I mean, there was more people saved in Asia. That's what John's letters were told, those churches. It was amazing, which is now Turkey, and you can't hardly find it. I mean, you, there's very few Christians there now, but it was, it was, they talked, some of the numbers that historians give to the church in Asia is huge. Like in Ephesus, some of them 100,000 people, 200,000 people in a church in, in those cities. Uh, the word of God built up, grew, grew strong, and then broke it. It says, it, mighty means it released great power. I like, to, I like to visualize the fact that we can build up the Word of God in our life. We can dam it up in our hearts. We can keep pouring it in until we get a breakthrough. You know, it's a, it's a lot easier to go through the process of building up if you believe you're going to get a breakthrough. Right? It's pretty hard to stay persistent in building up if you don't think you're going to get a breakthrough. So let's encourage ourselves just a little bit today and look at a few other ones. What other ones that we can think of? Egypt. I mean, Israel leaving Egypt, that's a huge breakthrough to get out of there, right? The Going into the promised land, it had to build up again for 40 years because they didn't have enough steam to get through. With, with, they didn't have enough word to go into the promised land. They could have. The resurrection. The resurrection. Oh, my gosh, yeah. We'll come back to that one. Jericho. Jericho. Man, yeah. Walking around, blowing trumpets, singing songs. What are you doing? You're building up. And one of the things that built up was the fear in, in those people. Man. You know, one of the things you got to do in sports is you got to get yourself confident. You got to get rid of your fear. But then you also use tactics to put fear into your, you know. I had a friend, and he played in a racquetball tournament down in Texas, and he knew he wasn't good as the guy, good, the guy in the university that was, you know. He, he knew he wasn't as good, so what he did, he grew his hair out, put a bandana on, went into the court in his bare feet. Look, I mean, this my friend John looked like a wild man anyway. We called him the Pink Panther. He was just a, really a stick with a mop on top, and uh, he had a heck of a brain, but uh, not too bad of a body as far as that, but... Uh, he said, the only reason I won is he walked in there. He said, I kept this crazy looking, uh, look in my eye and just played like a orangutan. And he said, I just freaked the guy out. He said, I beat him because the guy got freaked out at me playing in my bare feet and everything. And he said, I won the championship. So many times God says, you know, I'm going to put fear on the enemy. And that fear was built up. Boy, you read, you read about uh, wars in, in Africa, and so many of them were won by the people singing and chanting as they went there. They, had a, they were outnumbered, but they just, that in, that, that it's important. Those things are important. Any other breakthroughs in Scripture? A little louder. Yeah. And what a build-up. Think about that. You're escaping. You, you just ripped off Egypt. I don't, I, I don't, not too many people talking about this, but I find it one of the most amazing miracles in the, in the Bible is the fact that all the Israelites went to their Egyptians' friends and said, we're going to go worship our God. Finally, you know, we're going to get to go worship our God. Can you give us some gold and silver to go worship? Oh, yeah. And they gave them gold, silver, and clothes. Does that have any logic to it at all? Huh? Why... What a breakthrough. What a breakthrough financially. They ripped off Egypt. They had all their gold and silver and clothes, and they had it, you know, if, to what go? I mean, none of it makes sense to me. It's like, what were you thinking, Egyptians? If that wasn't a breakthrough of a favor of God, and then they get to the river, and now they got the army coming after them. They're kind of ticked off. They got all their stuff. And they just, you know, and, and the buildup. And boy, when it built up like that, you needed a breakthrough because it was, it was all coming to a head, right? I think we got a real buildup in America going right now of philosophies and idealistic uh, thoughts of bigger government. I mean, our government's, getting, our, our government's getting bigger and 
bigger, and they're hiring more guys. And then, you know, this whole Obamacare, they got to hire thousands of IRS agents to watch us all. They got, they got all these cameras on us, so they got to have people watch on. They got, they're just getting bigger and bigger. And I don't know about you, but it's getting more exciting and exciting to me. Uh, it was first terrifying. But now it's kind of exciting because you know why? There's going to be a breakthrough. And forgive me, but I am who I am. It's like a big zit on your face. It's going to pop. And there's going to be some great relief for some of us. But it is going to pop. Okay. Will there be collateral damage? Yeah. <laughs> but trust me, this big buildup we're seeing is going to blow. And they won't be around. How about the woman that was bent over for 18 years? 18 years. How about the woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years. 12 years. And she built up her desire to be healed. And she spent all that she had on doctors and grew worse. She, for 12 years, now listen, she could have easily given up and just submitted to that. And what our medical field says, you need to learn how to cope with this. She didn't. She kept building up her expectations to be free. In a culture that with that issue in her life, she was separated, she was untouchable, she was not able to socialize, she was not able. And yet by herself, by herself for 12 years, she built up a hope that she could be free. And she didn't know about Jesus. She didn't know. She just knew she wanted life and life abundant. There's a lot of people around the world right now building up their hope of having freedom and life in places that know nothing about Christ. But I've heard testimonies of monks in, in Tibet who, were, who had been seeking for life and they found Jesus without anybody preaching to them. And when the missionaries finally got there and said, preach Jesus, said, that's his name name and they were speaking in tongues already because they'd already been filled with the Holy Spirit but they didn't know the terminology but they already had a relationship why because God honors a buildup of desire to have life and he will answer he will bring a breakthrough wherever you are and the beautiful thing was it wasn't a group effort with this woman it was her and her alone and probably not even her husband or her family probably all by that time have you ever had somebody sick in your family so long you finally got disgusted with them And, and finally, you just have to separate because it just, you know, the rest of the family has to leave. I mean, somewhat, because you just. And, and thank God there are some people who just say, I won't be denied my breakthrough. And they just kept believing. And that's a long time, 12 years, 18 years. How about the guy that was at the, the uh, water, you know, waiting for the water to stir, you know. Uh, what a hopeless situation. Waiting for those waters to stir, but as soon as they did, somebody else jumped in, but he couldn't because he's paralyzed. I mean, you know, after about the fifth, sixth, tenth time, 40 years, I don't know, it'd be like, what am I doing here? I would have gave up. Some of the greatest breakthroughs in life didn't happen because a whole group of people did it because one individual wouldn't be denied. And breakthroughs are in the laws of of our creator that if you will build things up you will get a breakthrough you will get a breakthrough so you gotta build it up now the thing another law about life is nothing ever remains everything's moving Everything's moving. You're either going up, going down. You can't camp out very long, can you? You cannot get stagnant. That's what's real wrong about trying to take a break and just think, I just want to take a break and do nothing. That doesn't happen. You take a break, you slide downhill. Okay. 
You take a break to get restored and get yeah, that part's okay, but you got to have our intent. So persistence. Oh, how about the how about the widow uh, that went to the judge in Luke 18? She got a breakthrough, didn't she? And how did she get that? What was that lesson all about? She went to this judge that had no respect for humans and no respect for God. And she just kept saying, I want my legal rights. I want my legal rights. I want my legal rights. And he, he didn't respect her. He didn't honor her. But dang, she would not back off. She would not back off. She would not back off. And finally, he just said, this woman is going to kill me with her buildup. Give her what is hers. You know, she had legal right to it all along. She had legal right to it all along. She was not asking for any favor or anything else. She was asking for her legal rights to be upheld. And there are times that you and I have, you know, all the time, we have legal rights to, as godly people, we have legal rights to everything that God has. And we have legal rights to favor. We have legal rights to the power of God. We have legal rights to wisdom. We have the legal rights for joy and for peace and happiness. Those are all bought, paid for, signed off. There's nothing you and I have to do to earn it. They are ours legally, and everybody says, well, if they're ours, how come I don't have them? Because there is dams in this world that build, you know, that block and restrict the water from flowing, but you keep pushing on it, you're going to build up, and I guarantee you someday Hoover Dam's going to blow. It's going to weaken, and great will be the fall. And that's why, you know, you're going to get reports from everybody. You're too old. Your disease is incurable. You're financially too far gone. And you got your choice. You're going to let it. I'm not going to let it out anymore because <clears throat> <laughs> I was going to get a pump and I didn't get it done. So I'm doing the pumping myself. But listen, you, you're going to have to be consistent, persistent yourself. It is not a group effort. It's your heart. It's are you, you know, well, I don't know if I'll get a breakthrough. You know, listen, if that woman of eight, bent over 18 years said, I don't think I'll get a breakthrough, she wouldn't. If the guys carrying the paralytic thought, well, we probably won't get healed, they wouldn't have dug a hole in the roof and lowered him down. Is there a chance that you're, you're not going to get your breakthrough? Yeah. But it's a guaranteed you won't if you don't put the pressure on. It's guaranteed that it's over if you're going to say, well, okay, I'll just cope with this. I hate that. I mean, I really do. I just, when doctors say, you're just going to have to cope with this the rest of your life. <laughs> I squeak, I'm not going to just cope with something. I want to win. You know, I guess, you know, and the other thing is, the longer it takes to build it up, the bigger the breakthrough. And the more shouting that goes on when you do win. Sometimes I encourage myself when I've been believing for something for a long time and it's not happening. And I get discouraged and I'll just say to myself, if this goes another two years, when it does come, it is really going to be grand. Sometimes you've got to find ways to keep yourself putting the pressure on. And again, it's usually not a group effort. Even your own family will a lot of times just drop off on you. Give it up. But if you just stay persistent, you're going to get a breakthrough because it's in the laws of the universe. You can't have build up without breakthrough. Really? <laughs> you think you're nervous. It's in my face. In Titus 3, 4... Let's look there. Oh. <laughs> I felt something there. Time. Where's Titus? Sure. Well, Timothy's on vacation. 
Titus 3, 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared. The resurrection. The whole, the breakthrough. Think about this. The breakthrough of Jesus coming on the earth. How long did it take? Most people estimate around 4,000 years. On the day that Adam and Eve sinned, God said to him, Okay, you messed up. I'm putting my plan in to redeem mankind. And Satan, you bruised his heel. I'm going to crush your head. 4,000 years of building up the word of God in the earth through a few faithful people until at the right time. Romans 5, 6 says, at the right time. Say right time. There is a right time. It's usually not our time. It's usually not when we would pick it. How many of you thought you were at the midnight hour and said, God, you always come through at the midnight hour, and then it got to be one in the morning. (laughs) And now you're into another day and another week. It wasn't the right time. But at the right time, Christ appeared. At the right time. And we got saved. Not by our works, but by his grace at the right time. At the right time. You know, some, frankly, I'm really kind of happy that we were on the other side of the right time. Thank God there were faithful people like Noah. Talk about a buildup. Never seen rain. Didn't know what the concept was. Probably never was in a rowboat, let alone an ark. But he did it. And because he did it, and others did it, and Abraham did it, and all those guys did it, finally, at the right time, God could bring Jesus in. And the breakthrough of having him go to the cross, go to the grave, and the breakthrough of coming through in the resurrection for all mankind to have the power to be called the children of God. And for 4,000 years, God watched his children suffer. And you think you're going to talk him into right now just because you're ticked off? (laughs) It's not that he doesn't want you to have a breakthrough, but there are laws that rule that he set up that even he has to obey. And it takes a buildup. And every instantaneous miracle that is seen on the earth had a buildup. Just that some people didn't see it. They just saw the breakthrough. Some people are going to see your breakthrough... And go, oh, aren't you lucky? (laughs) Everything goes your way. But they didn't see all the huffing and puffing. All the persistent believing. That was the right time. I, I really thought that would happen up here, not down there. Class dismissed.